March NASA Night Sky Network uh, member webinar. Tonight we're hosting uh, the webinar from the offices of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. We're excited to uh, present this teleconference with our guest speaker, Dr. Orkin Umarhan from uh, NASA's, NASA, NASA's Ames Research Center in Mountain View, uh, California, just a little bit to the south of us, who will bring us up to date with the latest findings from the New Horizons missions flyby of the Pluto system last summer. Um, it'll be a little bit different, and he'll explain this uh, a little bit later. Uh, we actually have, uh, he actually has a, a bunch of images that um, are currently under embargo, and he's not really supposed to show them to anyone until Friday, but uh, so we're getting a sneak peek of uh, what some papers will come out with on, on Friday. Uh, you might notice uh, that there's both a chat window and a question and answer window in, uh, in, on your desktop. Um, the chat window is for folks to introduce themselves and for a general chat, along with any technical issues you might have during the webinar. The question and answer window is where you should submit questions for our guest speaker, and we'll get to those towards the end. It'll keep track of your questions so that we'll know um, if we've answered them or not. And I also need to remember to start recording if I don't do that. Oh, Dave, did you already start recording? Recording, but um, it's always good that we have a couple of announcements here. Um, clubs, clubs whose members have uh, created and logged at least two events in the first quarter of 2016 qualify to enter a drawing for a 3D printed set of Jovian moon models created by Jean at shapewave.com. And so this is a, a great thing. I think that we've got a picture on the website someplace so you can check out what these things look like. It's a great addition for your outreach events uh, if you're going to be looking at Jupiter. And Jupiter is going to be uh, pretty good here uh, coming up. And you can show visitors a, a good close-up view of each of the four major moons and discuss some of the features and actually look at these 3D printed models. And here's another uh, kind of a highlight is that Jupiter is high in the sky, perfect for observation. And NASA's Juno mission is going to be arriving there later this summer. And the May webinar on May 11th plan to join us uh, to hear from Stephen Levin, the project scientist for um, the Juno mission. And so that's, we're excited about that. So we have five sets of these to give away. Uh, so make sure you log your events for January through March. The more events your club logs, the more entries your club will have in the contest to get these. The deadline for logging events to qualify is April 16th, 2016. Also a reminder, clubs that log at least two outreach events each quarter are qualified to re receive toolkits. If you haven't received a toolkit in a while and your club has been logging events, you may have already received all of our toolkits. If so, please contact us at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org to request additional toolkit if needed or to see if we have any other materials we can ship to your club. Also, stick around after uh, the talk because we have uh, uh, a book to give away. We have uh, the Total Sky Watchers Manual. And uh, so after the presentation, I'll uh, hold one up and so you can see what it looks like. And we'll have uh, a little drawing of sorts, uh, a virtual drawing, uh, to see who might get one of those. So... Dr. Orkin Umarhan is a research scientist in space science at NASA Ames Research Center in Moffett Field, California. Dr. Umarhan's research focuses on evolutionary processes, both on planetary surfaces and in protoplanetary disks. He's published on a number of topics, including astrophysical flows and turbulence, fundamentals of shear flow, instabilities, geomorphology, and landform evolution, and its modeling. He joined the New Horizons Geology and Geophysics Investigation Team in June of 2013. His main role on the mission has been in providing mathematical modeling framework for the various geophysical systems, our scenarios of interest and appropriate to the Pluto system. Dr. Umarhan regularly writes blog posts for NASA about New Horizons, and he's also a co-author on a graduate level textbook on fluid dynamics for physicists due to come out this spring. Please welcome Orkin to the webinar. Hi, <laughs> I, I, it's uh, really pleased to be here. So, um, so I'm going to uh, start. I'm going to go straight away and start the uh, start. The, here we go. Share screen. Here we go. And I'm presuming that everyone can see this. Oh no. Hmm. 
I can see it. From oh, you can see it. Ah, yep. okay. In that Cliff case. Retreat. Is that what it's? Uh, uh, let me, there we go. I got it. I got it. Okay, here we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Reboot. <laughs> Okay, um, so I want to tell you about uh, the recent results we have uh, from the New Horizons Geology and Geophysics efforts. Uh, we have a paper that's coming out on Friday in Science Magazine. Uh, uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak preview of some of the results that we're going to report on. Um, it's very exciting, and, uh, and I want to emphasize I speak on behalf of the team and in the sense of Everyone is very, very, very excited by um, the results that we're coming out with and publishing. So let me uh, start off with just a little bit of a back background here. Um, as some of you well know, the, uh, Pluto is a member of the Kuiper Belt and the Kuiper Belt system. Some would call it it's the, the king of the Kuiper Belt. Some would call it the king of the dwarfs. It all depends on your perspective, of course. Um, I, I wanted to emphasize that. Uh, in the recent uh, years, we've discovered a whole uh, family of very large dwarf planets, of which Pluto and the pluto Charon system is one of them. And as you can see in the bottom panel here, uh, we have um, a whole number of other uh, planets, dwarf planets that have been discovered. And for a sense of size and scale, you can see how they relate to one another. Um, uh, a mission to Haumea would be cool because we're going to a, look like we'd be going to a giant football out there in the Kuiper Belt. But um, I, but you know this is just a personal opinion, of course. Anyways, so that's the Kuiper Belt. You know, and it's one of the Kuiper Belt had been postulated to exist long before it was discovered, and um, so it's actually in the last 15 years or so that uh, now this this region is beginning to be populated in terms of our knowledge of what's out there, and it's very exciting insofar as it is also essentially a relic of the formation stage of the solar system. So the things that we see out there are things that were there when the solar system was formed and in some ways is a, uh, a relic of that age. So just to kind of put things into context. As uh, Pluto was discovered and, you know, by Claude Tombaugh in 1930, and um, so that was uh, it was a big deal. It was it was a it was a hunt to discover an object that was thought to be out there. And uh, so it was discovered in 1930. And, and some of you, I, I won't go into the history of it, but uh, it was it has intrigued people ever since to see that there's this planet at this distance out there. And what might it be? We have here the best Hubble Space Telescope image of Pluto right prior to the New Horizons flyby. And uh, the bottom left here, you see essentially a true color map of, um, of, uh, of uh, Pluto itself. And it's actually, it's a composite image uh, through this magic of uh, uh, oversampling, it's called. When you take a number of images taken in rapid succession with one another and you can actually kind of lay them on top of each other and make it seem like it's actually of higher resolution but the true resolution of the images that were taken at that point even with Hubble Space Telescope is you you see on the right and it's fairly low resolution however we were able to identify uh, from that alone that the Pluto's surface has uh, a lot of interesting texture at those days, that's what we were kind of referring to it as, where the light and dark regions essentially uh, is a testament to its uh, uh, relative albedo on the surface. Now, in 1978, uh, Pluto was discovered to have a, uh, a companion, and um, in that companion, we call is called Charon, is in a synchronous orbit with Pluto. Uh, in about six and a half day period. Uh, and so meaning to say that it's synchronous is that the same face of both planets face each other as they go around in, um, uh, as they do their orbital dance. Now Sharon's surface was identified as having a lot of water ice through spectroscopic measurements. Um, and as of then, and actually as of now as well, there is no detected atmosphere on Charon. And to put this into context, the uh, relative size of Charon to Pluto is about two to one. In other words, Pluto's radius is twice that of Charon's, which puts its mass at approximately eight times that of Charon. So you might want to, you can kind of think of it as you and your two-year-old uh, 
child, <laughs> if you have a child, of course. So that kind of relate that that kind of relative mass uh, de- uh, mass size relationship. Uh, now, in the last few years, uh, and some of you have probably followed this story keenly, uh, four small rocky moons were discovered to be orbiting the pluto Charon system, uh, Styx, uh, Styx, Kerberos, Nix, and Hydra. And uh, I will show you at the end of, the, of this talk some images um, associated with uh, uh, some of the images we've got of those individual moons as well. So now the origins of these moons and where did they come from? And it's, a lot of these things are still kind of in, in debate, but it seems very likely that the origins of the entire system is a relic of a past impact that actually formed Charon itself. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, real quick, the surface composition, what I'm showing here in the top bar is a spectroscopic uh, a spectrum of the uh, surface uh, of uh, Pluto. And uh, you can see here, essentially what you should take away from this is that Pluto shows copious amounts of absorption in various volatiles, including carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen, and methane. And... Um, we were able to make estimates based on just these observations of the spectrum before we got to Pluto that the nitrogen on the surface dominates the uh, that of all the other volatiles by about 10 to 1. And that basically still kind of holds. Now, the atmosphere had been actually, dis- Pluto actually has an atmosphere and it was discovered to be there uh, about 20, 25 years ago, in 1985, I guess uh, it's almost 30 years ago now. Uh, and um, the surface pressure associated with the atmosphere is about 10 microbars. So that essentially puts that as at one one hundred thousandth the current surface pressure on the Earth. Uh, but I, uh, they, if you stay, if you pay attention to the press conference that will be. Uh, held at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in, uh, next Monday, uh, we have some interesting results uh, uh, talking about how this um, atmosphere may have actually gone through very strong climactic change over the last million years. So that's kind of very exciting stuff too. But of course, I really can't say a whole lot about that right now. Um, so yeah, uh, some of the stuff here is uh, still holds. The atmosphere is uh, considered to be steadily losing mass over the four billion year lifetime of Pluto itself. But exactly how much is being lost is now also under debate based on the results that we've gotten. But my my primary interest right now is to kind of talk about um, the surface and the geomorphology and the various ob- uh, geo geological features that we've uh, observed on the on Pluto itself and uh, and uh, also of uh, Charon um, here's a cutaway of our the the theorists who work on this um, who study the interior structure um, has, have essentially uh, identified based on the size and the mass uh, what kind of uh, internal structure is likely to be uh, uh, the case inside of Pluto. And you can see that actually Pluto is primarily, has primarily a rocky core and surrounding it a very thin, uh, you know, and thin, but I mean thin, could be up to from 20 to 50 kilometers thick water ocean. And then surrounding that, a, a water ice mantle of about 200 kilometers thick. And then the very, very top layers, the crust itself, the surface that's exposed to light, um, probably and likely con- uh, composed of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane as well. And so, well, actually, it turns out to be the case. So, and before I jump into the awesomeness that is the Pluto system, in terms of our New Horizons images, uh, let me say a few words about the origin of the Pluto Charon system. Uh, a lot of people have thought about the problem quite deeply, especially soon after it was discovered that uh, Charon was even there. And, uh, and it's likely from all the extensive modeling that's been done and scientific debates that have raged over the last 20 years on the matter, it seems that the, 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 the least offensive hypothesis 
<laughs> and you know, this is how we do things in science. We try to find the, uh, the a, a scenario that is the is is the least appears to be the least wrong. <laughs> uh, and we think that um, that the system was probably uh, born from a collision, very much like what we think the Earth Moon system. Uh, uh, came about in the same way that the Earth Moon system has come about. That there was a large impact uh, on Pluto. Part of Pluto was ripped out, and the debris was ripped out strong enough to remove it from the surface, but not strong enough to uh, leave the, uh, the gravitational pull of the of Pluto itself. And it eventually recollapsed and formed its uh, formed a planetary object, which is the moon Charon. And it's now, while we don't yet have 100% certain that this is also the origin of the, the small rocky moons, we do think that the, that seems to be the running hypothesis amongst most of the team members and most of the uh, members on the New Horizons team, who've, I mean, obviously, who've worked on this and who've thought about it very closely. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where things at, are at as far as the origins are concerned. Uh, the launch of New Horizons itself uh, was on January 19th, 2006. And uh, the, uh, the trajectory, oh, so let me just say a, a couple of very short words about the scientific payload. Uh, the New Horizons spacecraft itself is... Uh, the size of a grand piano. So what you see here, the artist's depiction of the spacecraft itself is uh, quite small. And in fact, the antenna dish itself being no larger than probably, I would say five, five and a half feet across in diameter um, is, too, is so small that the volume of data that we've actually acquired on the mission uh, requires about 16 months of download time because the antenna transmits at something like a thousand baud, which is like the old telephone modem lines, which uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I am old enough to remember suffering with one of those. But that's kind of how it is. Uh, and uh, But we're patient, and it gives us a lot of time to digest the information that does come down at the trickle rate. So um, maybe this is actually better time to uh, ingest our information and think about it as the data comes down. Anyway, so the instruments that are, there are seven instruments that are on the, um, on the uh, uh, spacecraft. Um, LORI is the high resolution imager and many of the images that I'll be talking to you about and showing you today are very high resolution images that, that come from this black and white camera. Um, some of our best images uh, come at about 90, uh, 80 to 90 meters per pixel. And each fra image frame is about 1024 square um, uh, pixel frame. So you can kind of get a sense for how close we must have gotten to the surface. Um, there are the other instruments. Uh, there's the uh, various uh, particle and dust counter instruments that are on board, Pepsi and the SDC, the student dust counter. SWAP is the plasma spectrometer, um, which is a, a spectrometer that is essentially measuring the amount of ionized particles that are coming, that are surrounding the Pluto system itself. Uh, REX is the radio science um, uh, observed, I mean, the radio science dish that's on there, so it's make, making uh, radio measurements of the surface. There's the um, ALICE instrument, which is the UV imaging sp and, and spectrometer. And then um, of concern for us, in addition to LORI, is the RALF instrument, which is the, um, it, it's, a, it's a composite, which is made of the MVIC and LISA cameras. Um, LISA, just to give you a sense, is a, actually, it's a 256 cube where actually the 256 gives you the uh, image frame and you have 256 channels for each frame which is used for resolving the spectrum of say a particular uh, say snapshot so essentially um, what we we are getting data cubes which is essentially you can for a given point on the surface resolve the, the resolution associated with that particular camera um, we, we get 256 wavelength bins in the infrared, so we can actually extract a very uh, a relatively detailed uh, um, spectrum 
in in the uh, in, in the infrared range, as I said. So, anyways, that gives you kind of the, the larger sense. Now, the the flight route itself, uh, as you can see here, um, took about ten years to get to the Pluto system, and um, it is now, as some of you may know, it's on its way out into the Kuiper Belt itself. So uh, we have an object that we have essentially directed the spacecraft to go to, the, a Kuiper Belt object called MU-69. And it uh, will, uh, if uh, Congress funds um, the mission, uh, there, will be other pe there will be people on the other side, on our side, to receive the data. Uh, and it will, it, should, uh, it will be arriving to the MU-69 system in uh, January 2019. So... More to come. Um, here is a close approach, the close approach geometry, and I won't spend too much time on it, but you can see essentially that the close approach flyby, all of the meat and the juicy stuff that we got were images and data crammed into essentially an eight hour, nine hour period uh, stretch of time. And uh, so, uh, you can imagine the precision with which the instruments need to be operating on and, and, uh, and so on. This is, of course, beyond anything that I could put my head around. Because this is high-tech, very clever engineering work. And um, those guys deserve a big um, tip of the hat. And uh, they did an amazing job. And all the people that made that part happen um, made our life very easy. <laughs> so... Let's get to the. Let's get to it. So here is um, the highest resolution image, full frame. We call this the Lori full frame images of both Pluto and Sharon. Pluto on the left, Sharon on the right, and uh, this is a a color. This is the color MVIC. So this is a little bit lower resolution than the highest resolution Lori images, but uh, we get on this end we have the the color images. This is a visual color. I neglected to mention that MVIC has these, these uh, the other camera, which has is basically imaging in four color bands in the visual bit. So there's the LISA instrument and then there's the MVIC. And MVIC um, is, has basically a red, green, and a blue, and then at what we call the methane band. There is a particular wavelength in the visual where methane absorbs quite strongly, and that's a deep red. And so we have those four, and this is a composite of um, that image uh, of that uh, of those snapshots taken with MVIC. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to get into some more uh, depth with this momentarily. I just want you to sort of uh, absorb and enjoy the grandeur that is this system. Uh, so here is a special, uh, a kind of a, a place name. Uh, on the for Pluto, and we have the, uh, the basically a bunch of the regions that we have currently identified, and we've identified to be geologically interesting, and we've often we've given them uh, names. Now, there's a whole story about how the names were selected, and there was there had been a um, a, a uh, international web campaign many, uh, a few years ago, where we were collecting names worldwide for suggestions for things for various categories, including. Um, Mostly uh, famous, uh, famous travelers, famous explorers, and um, and so on. So you can kind of see that uh, uh, some of the places that we uh, see here, obviously Voyager and Hayabusa and Pioneer, those were great explorers. Obviously, in this case, these were instruments that were sent out in the space in the past. Uh, but uh, you, you got can you can get a sense of uh, kind of the things that we um, were. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> the names that we've given. Here is a nice image of uh, Pluto in, in uh, as it passed through the um, uh, eclipsing uh, frame. Uh, let me just back up here. You can see in uh, the uh, right about uh, one o'clock on um, uh, on the day of closest approach. Uh, you see that the. New Horizons, actually, the, the spacecraft passed right directly behind Pluto. And so this is, what we see here is the, is the shine light that, um, on the, the eclipse site. And it is breathtaking. And we knew pretty much about a couple of months after when these images came down, and they were very highly resolved, that it looks like if you look off the limb here, it looks pretty clear that there is 
haze and there is actually structure in the atmosphere. So that was, um, that was that came to a great great surprise and and many people were quite elated to see such interesting uh, physics kind of taking place now this is a low incidence angle image of the sputnik planum region uh, this is the southern end of sputnik planum where right here if you look to the left you see these giant towering ice blocks and these can tower as high as five kilometers uh, this particular region that we're looking at um, to the left, this mountain range is the Hillary Monte, uh, this is the Norgay Montes, oh, I might have gotten it flipped around, I'm sorry, I think it's the other way around. But uh, this, uh, this region is uh, pretty astonishing and uh, I just, uh, we, we're still trying to figure out um, how these things got there. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that as, uh, as I cruise on along here. Uh, Sputnik Planum itself is this big giant nitrogen ice uh, um, sea. And then you see that on the right, and this is the southern end of it. And I'll say some few more words about that in a moment. This is the MVIC image composite. So that, as I had mentioned earlier, that's the images taken with the MVIC camera in the four color bands. And this was essentially kind of assembled together, kind of in this psychedelic tone, which is quite nice. And it gives you essentially each of the colors here indicate um, various kind of various types of topography um, and chemical composition. Now, what they are, we're still trying to figure that out. But it kind of gives you a sense of um, the the uh, variety that is the that is Pluto's surface itself. Let me show you a couple of images here now, um, which focuses on the various absorption features that are associated with the surface. So this is based on the LISA camera that I was telling you a little about before. And you see, essentially, this is an image of the surface, and then associated with that particular image is the location of a particular ice, uh, particular volatile absorption uh, wavelength. So this is some, there's an absorption uh, feature in, uh, let's say, in, in, in I forget what the number is, but it's, it's in the um, infrared regime. And essentially, you can see where the majority of the methane ice is um, present. And it's pretty much all over the place, which is pretty, uh, quite amazing. Uh, this region, Tartarus Dorsa, is very interesting because it shows prominent methane uh, absorption, and we have some ideas about what that might mean about what that region is composed of. You also will notice down on the lower left that the Cthulhu Regio region itself shows a particular absence of um, of methane absorption. So just what we're doing is we're trying to make sense of how these particular locations and absorption features on the planet correlate with what we see um, geologically and geomorphologically. Um, here's a similar image associated with the nitrogen ice absorption. And, um, and you can see here that the nitrogen ice is also quite prevalent, but is particularly prevalent in the Sputnik Planum region, uh, the, uh, the region that uh, was commonly referred, or the Tombaugh Regio itself it was called the heart of Pluto. And this would be the left ventricle, or well, that'd be the right ventricle. It depends on what side of Pluto you're on, right? Uh, the, um, you can see that Sputnik has a tremendous amount of uh, nitrogen absorption, and it's pretty clear that that is a giant nitrogen ice pool C. Um, similarly, because of the similar uh, bond structures that are shared in common between nitrogen, N2, and, and uh, carbon monoxide, CO, um, the CO and nitrogen generally appear together when they do appear on the surface, but the CO absorption and the amount of CO is considerably less. But nonetheless, you see that there is quite a bit of uh, uh, carbon monoxide um, on the surface of Sputnik Planum. So, uh, you know, it's not the kind of place that you want to make, uh, you want your spacesuit to have a, a leak or a way for carbon monoxide to penetrate and contaminate your oxygen supply, uh, because that would be bad and you would die. But, uh, but, uh, it's, it, provided that doesn't happen, um, <laughs> yeah, this would be a great place to go and study the behavior of these ices at these low temperatures. And that's one of the things I will get to at the very end. For us, it's very exciting to see 
that what we see of Pluto is that it's an active low temperature physics laboratory, one that you couldn't, it's very difficult to actually reproduce on Earth, but here we have it and we see it actually doing something. So it's really kind of, uh, it's exciting for all of us, I have to say. Um, here is a corresponding water ice uh, absorption image and you can see where the water ice is and it, it's pretty much uh, concentrated in the Cthulhu Regio region and in off in many of the highland regions surrounding uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 plant, the region around, say, Sputnik Planum itself. Let me show you, this was released on the NASA webpage about two, three weeks ago. And this is an updated, so this is what happens when you update your data and we're getting more data coming down and we're able to refine our, our maps that we're making. So on the left is the old water absorption map and on the right is the updated one. So we have, uh, we were able to uh, generate a, a lot of improvement in that. And, and you can see here, in the this region, which is the Tom, uh, the um, Cthulhu Regio region, which is very dark, also shows a strong prominence for wa water absorption as well. So it's suggesting that the dark material is probably a bunch of uh, 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 you know organic compounds that have rained down onto the surface, and that surface is primarily water ice, and it's got all this kind of. It basically, you can think of it as ash, what we call tholins. Uh, has rained down on the surface itself. So it's uh, something that um, uh, we are, uh, many of the guy, folks over in the atmospheres and composition team are actively trying to work out and develop a better model understanding of um, the processes that lead to that coloration and, um, and um, what else we might be actually seen on the surface but that's a talk for someone else <laughs> who's actually an expert uh, here i want to just show you basically um what the, the the professional geologists and planetary geologists on our team um including um uh, my colleague oliver white he has uh, gone through these painstaking detail of mapping out various what we call units the geologic features and, and then essentially color coding them and uh, kind of as a personal map from us. This is not a geologic map. This is basically a map of units, what we call units, various terrain types and whatnot that we're still trying to figure out what they are. So just kind of give you a sense of like how much data and, and stuff that we're dealing with. So it's also pretty exciting because there's just like so much here to understand. Um, Here's some more place names around Sputnik Planum. Uh, kind of a, this is a, these are the, a number of lorry images. Uh, and you can, if you look over to the left here, you can see um, we have in Sputnik Planum, we have a number of features which are essentially water ice blocks mm -hmm. that have floated out into the middle of Sputnik Planum. Um, I don't know if this is something that many of you are aware of, but uh, it turns out that nitrogen ice itself is more dense than water ice. So in the same way as you have glaciers on the surface of, uh, of the earth near the poles, um, similarly, uh, water ice blocks themselves, if they make it out onto the Sputnik Planum, are likely to be floaters, and they float along and uh, until some of the process either pulls it down or they disintegrate, things that we don't yet fully understand. But um, it is kind of quite interesting. If you look here to the right, you see the uh, Norgay Montes, which is the mountain range that I showed you in the low incidence angle image, and then just north of it, the Hillary Montes. And these blocks themselves, which, as I said before, tower up to four or five kilometers from the base, of, uh, of the visual base, like i.e. the Sputnik Planum itself, these are all water ice blocks. So whether or not they're actually rooted to the base of the base of Sputnik Planum, the basin itself, or whether or not they're floating, uh, we don't know, but it's quite likely that if they are just lone ice bits that are floating out, that they are indeed floating. And, um, and uh, so a lot of work needs to be done on this, of course, but that, uh, that's kind of where we are thinking as a team is that we have, we're starting to think about a lot of the, the, the physics associated with that. 
Here is another uh, image, again, mapping out, um, uh, done by Oliver White as well, uh, uh, map, uh, sort of designating the various landforms that we have on the surface. And I want to get now to some of the good stuff that we have kind of all over the place. So you, essentially the middle bit here is primarily water, I mean, uh, nitrogen ice, and uh, as well as the, 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 the lighter blue region. But the textures begin to show variation as you make your way from the middle out towards the edge. I won't go into much depth about that right now, but uh, the, the, um, the, the way that this is, uh, uh, we're approaching this thing in a way that makes it, um, uh, it gives us a lot of, um, um, elements to start working to understand in terms of separate units of things. So uh, go on to the next. Let's get into some of the good stuff. So the, this is an, a high resolution image of the middle of Sputnik Planet itself. And you can see here to the left, you see essentially we have a bunch of polygonal ovoid patterns. And it is likely that this is an example of um, what it's, what's called solid state convection. Uh, nitrogen ice under these conditions is effectively very mushy, something in between um, kind of night, like water ice grains and, and say silly putty. Let's say something in between, uh, in between the two. It has this very interesting feature that it is, it's easily deformable and it's actually quite insulating. Um, in fact, nitrogen ice is about, uh, about 20 times more insulating than water ice. So it turns out that based on the uh, certain calculations that are done, that the interior of, of, uh, of Pluto, uh, has, there's a geothermal gradient that comes out from the interior of the planet, and that has to do with radioactive decay of various elements like uranium and thorium, just much like with the Earth. And that's enough to drive buoyant convection in this uh, nitrogen ice material. And what I mean by buoyant convection, uh, and you can see here is sort of a simulation of buoyant convection under conditions that are somewhat similar uh, to the nitrogen ice that we see here, is basically when you have a fluid and you heat it, uh, by heating a fluid element of it becomes more uh, buoyant, i.e. less dense, and it floats to the surface. But when it comes to the surface, it sees the outside, it sees outer space, and that uh, fluid then cools off, but, but in cooling off, it, um, it, uh, um, uh, the density goes up. And then as a result, you can actually set up this giant cycle. And that's basically what you see here, kind of depicted in this numerical simulation, where you have this material is rising, makes its way to the surface, and then kind of slides over in this conveyor belt type of fashion. Um, this is it's actually a simulation that's meant to be somewhat representative of uh, what we think is going on in the interior of um, Pluto itself. But there's a lot of active work and a lot of individual groups that are working on this problem. But it kind of gives you a sense of the time scales that we think is, um, are, are actually um, active. So this looks quite vigorous and, and active, but this has taken place over tens of thousands of years. So just to kind of give you a flavor. Um, right, so um, here's another uh, nice uh, work that was done by um, Oliver White and the others on, the, uh, and on our geology mapping team. And essentially the dark regions that you see, the dark lines is actually a outlines of the, uh, the cell boundaries associated with the convection itself. And uh, what's nice about this is that it gives you a sense of uh, I ought to add that the boundaries of the cells themselves are um, places where the nitrogen ice is actually descending down and towards the interior. Now, how deep is Sputnik Planum? We don't know. But uh, estimates put it anywhere between, say, two kilometers deep to up to five kilometers deep. And this is actually currently an area of active, active research. And I might add, debate as uh, as uh, good scientists uh, tend to do, they tend to debate and they tend to question. And, and so we don't know how deep it is, but it could be anywhere between those um, two extreme um, numbers. So it kind of gives you a sense of what, uh, the, this, this picture is quite nice. So <laughs> we jokingly call it the brain. 
it's not a brain, obviously. I mean, don't quote me on that. But it, it, it's a map of the the downwelling locations. Anyways, so let me move on here. Um, I'll skip over this. Um, uh, this is an image of the uh, the um, the mountain range called uh, the Al Idrisi mountain range, which is on the northwestern end of uh, Sputnik Planum. And these are water ice blocks, and we really don't know how they got there, but they do look like they came from the highlands that surround Sputnik Planum itself. So they probably came from regions further northwest of where these blocks are actually located. Um, and as I mentioned before, these water ice block, these water block, these blocks themselves are primarily water ice. So it's possible that these are indeed also, as I mentioned earlier, bits that are floating off into the interior. Um, the origin, the whys, we don't know yet, uh, but this is stuff that we're actively working on. Here's something that I actually am deeply involved with, and it's the question of glacial ice and glacial flow onto Sputnik Planet itself. And this is a this is a, a, a fascinating image where it shows clearly an, a, an example of, um, of of flow that has has come from the highlands, and the highlands here are over to the right. These are color coded so that red is high elevation and the purple blue are low elevation. And um, if you look very closely, you can see what appears to be flow lines and what are called glacial moraines. The darkened materials in the icy flats uh, that spill out into Sputnik Planum itself. Um, are an, are an indication of uh, a kind of a flow pattern, uh, probably debris that was left behind. And you can kind of see as well where the red arrows are pointed, locations where the uh, flow, what, are, what we call flow lobes, um, where the extent of this particular flow event kind of uh, reached. Uh, so this is not nitrogen ice and it's likely this nitrogen ice over time had built up in the highlands and made its way down in the flats below. Um, what's also interesting is if you look kind of carefully you can see just above this red arrow here the top red arrow on the left you see a bunch of individual um, blocks. These are water ice blocks themselves and they are possibly possibly might have come uh, from the highlands themselves. So that's stuff that we're kind of uh, trying to, you know, make good sense of. Here is an image that is um, quite fascinating. And this is an example of what we think is consistent with, but we don't know for sure, consistent with the notion that maybe this is a, 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 a cryovolcano. And this is essentially, these are these beautiful mounds and uh, they're quite high. Uh, and they um, have these deep vents, and the structures themselves are quite new, and we judge them to be quite new because there's a clear absence of, uh, of craters in the zone surrounding them. So uh, I, I don't want to say too much about this right now because this is part of the paper that's coming out in a couple of days, but just to kind of give you a sense that uh, this is the case, uh, the top image is uh, what's called right mons. And the one below is called Picard Mons. And um, yeah, well, I, and I, so those are the actual images themselves. And then to the left, to the right, you see essentially the, um, the elevation maps associated with it. I won't give you those numbers, uh, but if you wait a couple of days, you can get those numbers as well. Um, now, whether or not uh, cryovolcanism, what is it made of? What we know is that this material is probably water ice itself. And, uh, and at the moment, it doesn't appear to be active, but due to the lack of craters around it, eh, it was probably active or came about in the geologic recent history. What that is as well is something you're going to have to kind of read about in the paper in a couple of days. Um, we also have very clear evidence of tectonism, past tectonism on the surface. And... Uh, Okay, and uh, I, it's really quite a beautiful image. This is an image of the region of uh, uh, Tambao Ridge, I'm uh, sorry, um, uh, Cthulhu Regio. And you can see here the giant crack, uh, what's called Enone Fase, and that giant crack um, 
kind of settles onto this, what's called the Elliot Crater. It looks like this giant eyeball looking back at you. And what's amazing about this system is that this is uh, in the middle of the crater is a lot of nitrogen ice. And it, we don't know what those, what, look, what looks like the bloodshot eye, the, the, the bloodshot vessels, <laughs> but we think there's probably, I, you know, it could be a number of things, but it's clearly nitrogen ice and it's got some kind of activity going on inside there. I'm sorry, not in honor of Fossey. This is Virgil Fossey. Uh, excuse me. I think I'm mixed up. Uh, I'll skip over that. Uh, I'll skip over this. This is the cliff retreat. And uh, this is a region which is quite interesting. It looks like what we call scarp retreat. Um, there's a region in the northwestern bit of Sputnik Planum, and it looks like this is a landform that's undergoing sublimation, and in doing so, the landform is degrading and taking on the shape that we see here. Piri Planitia and Vega Terra are essentially separated by these cliffs that are um, you know, a kilometer or so deep, and it's probably uh, something that's a process in which this this cliff form is likely retreating. The upper regions have lots of methane. The lower regions, like the Periplanitia area, has lots of water, ice, and a, a clear absence of methane. So the idea being, you're seeing some kind of methane-driven sublimation process. Um, similarly, we have this famous place thing called the bladed terrain, the snakeskin terrain, and uh, the uh, the uh, this region is um, has is primarily made of nitrogen um, methane ice, and you see the snakeskin texture. Um, these textures, uh, the the slopes associated with them, are very steep, and we are not really clear on uh, how this structure comes about. Um, we have a number of very uh, uh, sexy speculative ideas about where they came from. Again, something that you. But I would highly recommend that you uh, tune in in a few days and you'll hear some more about that. Um, all right, so I'm going to skip over this. Uh, when I want to get to this point here, and then I want to say a few words about um, um, uh, uh, Sharon. Implication of crater statistics shows that there is a wide range of ages represented on the surface. Some bits are very old up to four billion years old. And some regions, for instance, Sputniplanum, very young. In fact, we can't actually date how young it is. It's that young, because there's no evidence of craters in that, in, in that, in that region, as, a, as an example. So it's, uh, it's so exciting, because this, as I said earlier, this is a system which is geologically active. It ain't dead, and it's doing a lot of things that's keeping a lot of us busy, <laughs> trying to make sense of. Um, let me just do, uh, I want to get through this and I want to show you some uh, pictures of uh, the rocks. I'm sadly, I wish if I had a little bit more time and that's uh, normally this talk I have is an hour long talk. Uh, I, I would say some a lot more about um, Sharon. Um, one of the major things about Sharon that has caught our attention is that Sharon has this strong tectonic belt, which probably came about from the freezing likely due to the freezing of its liquid water ammonium mixed ocean which is uh, that was present way back when many billions of years ago but as the planet as the moon cooled off that ocean froze and in freezing causes an expansion and these these uh, these cracks you see as a result of uh, extensional cracking, as we call it. But what's interesting is that the northern half of the regions north of it are this very rugged terrain, rugged cratered terrain, and the regions south of it are relatively smooth, also cratered, but not nearly as much, but very smooth plains. And so the, the question of interest is, why the asymmetry? Um, we don't, we can't really say a lot about that right now, um, but uh, I just kind of want to give you a flavor of that region here. Uh, you see that the, uh, the, the Vulcan Planum itself is relatively, relatively cool, uh, and relatively flat. Also, it's pretty cool from a like kind of wow, kind of cool perspective, but the, it's they're relatively uh, very smooth and it's probably, you know, a result of ancient, viscous, very slushy ice flow back way back when, three to four billion years ago, probably right around when 
Sharon was still active in its interior, but now that that activity is long gone, and Sharon is essentially it's a is a, is geologically dead by by comparison. Here's a very nice um, image of Sharon at a relatively high um, uh, resolution, and uh, this image was released back in December. And uh, so, yeah, you can kind of uh, kind of gaze upon the wonder that's this uh, this system. I uh, I wish I could dwell on this a bit more, but uh, I'm kind of running out of time. Let me, I'm going to skip over to the last few slides. Um, the images that we see here are of the moons, the small little moonlets, and you kind of get a sense here for the, uh, the scales that we're looking at. Um, and we had a whole team of people uh, devoted to studying not just the shape, but how the moons rotate on their axes and how they orbit around uh, the uh, uh, around the Pluto Charon system. And um, that kind of gives you a flavor of kind of what we're what we're um, what we're what we're dealing with. Um, many ideas that we've had, especially of Hydra and possibly even Kerberos, is that these are actually uh, these are these are composite structures where two smaller rocks merged together to form the structures that we're seeing. Uh, again, these are still hypotheses and still undergoing tremendous amount of tests, but that's some of the things that were the ideas that we're kicking around in terms of trying to make sense of the system. Um, here's some, you, you, uh, I, I'll leave, I'll skip over this as sort of a list of the various properties of the small moons. And I just want to show you this. This is essentially based on detailed studies of the relative orientations of the moons during the course of the flyby. We're able to actually extract a number, including the flyby and also including um, uh, from observations made of the system before, we can kind of we've made a bit of a a, a, system, a movie of how the uh, the moons orbit each other, and for some reason, sadly, it is not. Um, here, let's try it this way. So you all can see that. Just a minute. Mm, well, I'm set. Um, I'm sorry. It's um, this is a uh, not running uh, but in the uh, upcoming uh, days when we post the full file associated with this you'll see this movie run and one of the things that uh, would be interesting to keep in mind is that uh, Hydra the further the moon that's furthest out spins extremely fast compared to the other moons so it also poses kind of a theoretical conundrum for for the theorists on the team who work on orbital dynamics and, and uh, the evolution of sort of lumpy objects, you know, in orbit. Um, so I'm getting close to the end. This is a, this is a, the famous space artist from the, you know, forties, fifties and sixties, Chesley Bonestell's. That was actually his vision of what Pluto might be looking like. And, you know, it was um, incredibly prescient uh, by many people's standards. This is the, uh, the artist's rendition of, uh, of the similar uh, uh, of Pluto as well. And this is the one I started to talk off with. And um, so, uh, you, know, it, it, uh, you know, the artists uh, who were thinking about these things kind of, uh, in this case, kind of had it right. I mean, I'm not saying this is absolutely right, but it's uh, definitely very similar to the things that we see on the surface of Pluto. So I kind of want to end it with that. Um, that I was had time. I was going to hopefully have some time for um, uh, some three D images, but I think um, that won't be uh, possible. Uh, but hopefully, in the updated version of the PowerPoint pop file, I will provide for you all after the embargo period is up. Then I'll provide those images as well, so you can enjoy them um, at home. Well, I guess that's basically it for me. Um, I, uh, is, uh, yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Umar Han. So that was, uh, you know, I really enjoyed that. I thought that it was a uh, fantastic, uh, um, images and really a lot of insights. And we do have a few questions from, uh, some of the listeners and we've had uh, a grand total of uh, 69 different people have uh, logged in during the course of this. And so that's, uh, Pretty good. So we had a question from uh, a long time ago. Uh, Jorge asks for his son, and I'm, I'm not sure how to 
who uh, pronounced his name Kamon, uh, I believe, nine years old, asks, why does Pluto have a heart? <laughs> why does Pluto have a heart? Uh, we don't know. I mean, uh, all, the only thing that we can surmise is that this region where it looks like a heart, uh, and especially the Sputnik Planum region, the left side of that heart, is likely to be a very, very deep, uh, uh, it's a deep basin, and it may be a vestige of the original impact event that created the, the Charon Pluto system itself. Uh, but again, we, we don't know, uh, but uh, it is likely to be the low part the lowest part of Pluto, kind of almost like the Death Valley of Pluto, but this Death Valley is filled in with all this nitrogen ice. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things that uh, we don't quite know, but uh, we are working on that problem. That's for sure. We're out trying to ask that question and try to get an answer for it. Great. Thank you. Jim Small asks, in the lower left of uh, one of the Charon photos, there's a nearly linear string of craters. Is that a coincidence? They were uh, to the left of uh, the word smooth. Uh, let's see here. Uh, can, uh, are you all able to see my screen? Um, can you make it larger? Can you put it full screen on yours? Oh, yeah, I can. I just That'll I help. seem to have lost the, uh, here we go. Oh, 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 here, here we go. How's that? Great. And so the lower left. And uh, left of the word smooth. Left of the word, I don't see what you're speaking of here. Maybe We're talking about Sharon here, right? Yes. I actually think it was one of the earlier images. Here, let me go back then. There. Lower left, uh, oh, this, uh, I see a string here. Well, I mean, the, String crater events are common, especially uh, in the outer solar system. But when you have these incident angle approaches for objects that are, say, giant meteors or whatever they may be, um, they, they'll break up. And when, as they pass over, they can break up and then basically leave a trace of the, the trajectory that the, the, that, um, you know, the, the object itself was undergoing. So, Oftentimes, when you see strings like that, it's a sign of uh, that type of impact, type of impact event. I am not a specialist, by the way, in um, in, in uh, crater impacts and the impact uh, physics as well. So uh, that's the best I can kind of answer I can give you. I can tell you about other things. I can, and if you want, I can also send email, uh, contact information for the people on our team who do work on that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Kathy East asks a question, and, and um, since I'm a geologist, this is a, a good question too. Um, how can assumptions be made on the age based on the lack of craters when there is no baseline to compare it to? How do geologists know a timeline for cratering or if cratering is common in this section of the solar system? Yeah, it, the cratering, now, th there is uh, there are many, okay, so this goes back to uh, the solar system history itself. And there was a phase uh, during, right after the planets have formed, uh, in which the solar system was essentially going through this rearrangement, self-rearrangement. And that's called the late heavy bombardment. And that occurred about a half a, mil a, half a billion to a billion years after uh, the planets and the uh, essentially the bulk of the solar system itself had formed. And during that period of time, during the late heavy bombardment, all the remaining debris of the solar system itself was either churned up, eaten up by the sun, or spat out into the far reaches of, uh, uh, out of the system itself. Now, the numbers and statistics associated with that late heavy bombardment itself, those are fairly, fairly well known. So what the, many of the theorists then can do is you, 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 uh, you can take the, um, the density of impactors as a function of time, and then you run events on terms of how many impacts you expect during late heavy, uh, late heavy bombardment. And then from that, um, 
you leave an imprint on the surface as well. So based on all the various models that are associated with the late heavy bombardment phase of the solar system's history, um, you can essentially measure the size of the craters that you see and you find the smallest ones that are resolvable and the smallest ones that are resolvable are the ones that are the oldest ones that are, I mean, in, sense, in the following sense that smaller craters degrade faster than larger craters. So you, by assessing where the, the crater distribution on the surface turns off, you can actually pin an age associated with the, that surface. And so based on that and the, based on what you observe, coupled with what is expected from theory uh, to be the case during the late heavy bombardment, you can kind of correlate and establish a time. And that time is, uh, is what we, we use to indicate what the various ages. And so as far as regions of Pluto and Charon are concerned, some regions show a copious amount of craters and you can actually clearly date that region. And some regions like, like Platinum show no craters. So if there were craters from before, they got washed out because of the activity that's taking place. So we can't tell you how old it is, but we can tell you how old it isn't. It's kind of like you flip the, you kind of flip the, the, the reasoning around. Yeah. So for instance, with Sputnik Planum, we can pretty safely say that um, it is no younger, I mean, no older than 10 million years, which is a very small fraction compared to the, um, in the history of the, uh, of the system itself. So that's kind of roughly how we kind of think yeah. about these things. Well, we're, uh, we're, we're past time, but we're going to go one last question and then, uh, then we'll wrap up here. And so, uh, uh, Orkin, if you could go ahead and turn your screen share off, that would be a uh, good okay. to, forget to ask. So the last question that I, um, that we'll pose, and we're going to end up having to leave a couple of really good questions on the, on the table here. Uh, but Bruce Tinkler asks, what is the most surprising thing you've learned about Pluto? from the New Horizons flyby? <laughs> the most surprising thing. Uh, I mean, I, uh, for me personally, uh, I don't, I'm not saying I speak for the team, but for me personally, the most surprising thing was uh, to discover a place that was active and that was a, like I mentioned earlier, like a low temperature physics laboratory. Uh, to see the nitrogen glacier ice and to see, and for me personally, um, to see also that there's buoyant convection in the ice that we're observing and uh, almost textbook-like, you know, things that we don't normally see in nature, but we see in textbooks. And you kind of see that also on the surface itself. It's, that was very surprising. It was almost like a gift from the heavens, you know, that, here is some data to look at and you can develop your theoretical understandings of what's going on and it, uh, and it was like a gift. So for me, it was surprising to see such pristine examples of uh, so many geophysical processes um, in, in, in a very clean way. So uh, that's me, you know, that keep me busy for the next, uh, you know, dozen years, I think even. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Well, this has been uh, most informative. I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing the uh, full resolution of the images. And um, so we'll uh, close in just a moment. But as promised earlier, I said that we were going to have a little raffle for this lovely book, which uh, um, our Vivian and David, who are uh, also on the Night Sky Network team, were uh, co-authors of this. And so we, we keep on trying to think of uh, what's the best way to uh, be able to raffle this off to everyone. And so we hit upon this. And so if everyone's ready in the chat window, we're going to take the sixth person to type in the number six. And Vivian's going to keep track of, uh, of who's doing this. So, <laughs> okay, I think we're well, well past six now. So, <laughs> so uh, Vivian will keep track of that. And she will send you a little note and, um, and connect with you so that uh, we can make sure that the book comes to you. So, uh, a little congratulations bit. to Skip Bird. <laughs> oh, my. So, congratulations, Skip. So. Okay, well, that's all for tonight. Uh, you can find this telecon along with many, or this webinar, along with many others on the Night Sky Network uh, webpage under the Outreach Resources section. section. Just search for webinar. Tonight's presentation post, 
posted on the Nightscan Network YouTube page and dedicated resource page will be up by the end of the week with all of those nice full resolution uh, embargoed images and the 3D uh, images as well. And so get your uh, um, anaglyph glasses out and uh, uh, tune them up uh, for some good, good viewing. And so good night, everyone. Keep looking up and mark your calendars for our next webinar on Monday, April 18th, when we will hear from Dr. Larry Nittler on the Mercury Messenger mission uh, from one end of the solar system to the other. Uh, I think. Uh, and mark your calendar for Monday, May 9th, for a very nice transit of Mercury. Thank you very much. We'll see you next month, and good night.